Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Reference Point. I'm your host, Dave Cokerhook. This evening, I've got a friend and former business colleague with me, by a gentleman named Steve Austin. Steve and I met when his uh, company was involved in the renewable energy industry, specifically the biodiesel industry. And tonight, we're going to talk about renewable energy sources. We're going to talk about what's happening in that arena, what the impact is of uh, migrating away or the need to migrate away from so much fossil fuel utilization and the impact uh, economically, socially, environmentally of uh, this whole area of energy. So Steve, welcome to the show. Pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you, Dave. I'm glad to be here. So let's talk a little bit about how this whole thing started for you and I. You were working with a company that was in the biodiesel arena. And you, when, a couple of days ago when we were discussing before the show, you were telling me that things have changed dramatically within that arena because of some of the economic environments that are going on and stuff. So talk a little bit about what's really happening today in the renewable energy world. Well, the renewable energy has really, it's a very dynamic market. There's lots of activities, there's investments going on globally, and there's been dramatic changes in the last couple of years. Four or five years ago, it was in all the papers and magazines, uh, ethanol and biodiesel was very popular. Right, I remember. And both of those were what we would call first generation. We're now working on second and third generation technology. So first generation was biodiesel soy from the, uh, the Midwest where the soy is raised and corn was going to ethanol. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, with world population growing, there was a lot of demand for all commodities. Remember, there was growth going on everywhere. Sure. Steel was going up, and fuel went up, right? Well over $100, 140 a barrel. At the same time, all the commodities went up, and uh, the ethanol and the biodiesel makers were really caught in the margin squeeze. And both of them, they really don't work when they're below about $60 a barrel. You know, renewable energies are more expensive than putting a pipe in the ground. So, so what you're saying, if I understand correctly, is that when a year and a half ago, the price of uh, a barrel of oil was through the roof, and everybody's running around paying 4 or $5 a gallon for, for gasoline here in the States. Of course, right. they've always been doing that in Europe for a long time. But you're saying that when, the, and, and at, when it was at that kind of a price point, then it was making economic sense for people to heavily move in the direction of biodiesel and ethanol. Is that what I'm saying? That's right. You're saying? And when the recession came and business slowed down, at the same time, oil began to drop because less consumption. When the oil went down to $40 a barrel, that was way below the break-even point for the ethanol and the biodiesel makers. So that industry got squeezed. Got it. At the same time, a lot of emphasis shifted towards, remember, people talked about using renewables that were not from any kind of food source. We're all, right, right. So right. there was a shift to move away from the soy and to move towards jatropha, which is a seed that can't be eaten and other kinds of uh, uh, renewable stocks, and then second and third generation, in other words, more efficient technology. Mm -hmm. So there's a big move uh, across the board on that. And it's happening uh, from government legislation, mm -hmm. uh, both in the US, throughout Europe, and the Far East, and also because we export uh, so much money we buy all this fuel, we send so much money out of the country, so Department of Defense and DARPA has invested fortunes in the U.S. to develop its own uh, liquid renewable energy. And a lot of progress is, is, is going. Uh, we'll see big changes in the next few years as it's commercialized. And is that, so, so the impact of that, I, I'm guessing, is going to be very positive. One of the things that I remember from, gosh, I don't know how many of the last, you know, however many presidents when they came into office, one of the things they've been touting is finding ways for us to become less reliant on uh, foreign oil. Oil. I mean, we, we are still in an oil-based economy. That's right. Uh, we're trying to find our way uh, out of the dominant oil-based economy, fossil fuel-based mm -hmm. economy, but at the moment we're still in it. We use a lot of coal, we use a lot of natural gas, we use a lot of oil. Mm -hmm. And every president has been trying to say they're trying to get away from that. But we haven't gotten very far. Why is that? Because oil and coal are fantastic sources of energy. That's the way it is. They're high density, meaning there's a lot of energy per unit. And while we complain that it's expensive, we have a lot of coal in this country. It's actually going to be a long-term savior for our country. And so moving away is difficult because what's the replacement? Everything works with liquid fuels needs something uh, right. that's... Uh, petroleum-based or renewable-based, and right now, and up until now, it's been too expensive. You know, when oil was only $10 a barrel and CO2 in the atmosphere was no problem, 
then there was no incentive to do anything along these lines. Right. And there shouldn't have been, because why? It would have been more expensive. Got it. Now, I've been seeing that many of the oil companies, I'll use quote-unquote oil companies, are sort of repositioning themselves as energy companies now. Mm -hmm. Exxon and, and Chevron and, right. and Arco, they're all talking about these other things, geothermal mm -hmm. and biodiesel mm -hmm. and, and to some mm -hmm. degree nuclear and all sorts of stuff. So is this all window dressing or are these companies really looking for renewable sources or alternative sources to fossil fuels? Well, I'm not on the inside of the petroleum industry, so I can't say how much window dressing or not, but I can say that they're putting their own money into investments for R&D. For example, Chevron, which is California-based, has now got money invested with UC Davis, which is one of the leading agricultural universities in the world. Mm -hmm. And they're, they've got three uh, small farms for Jatropha, which is a, a species of a plant that is a high oil yielding. So who would have ever imagined Chevron investing in this kind of uh, work? Uh, Exxon and Mobil have money in various universities, a lot of money at UC Berkeley for research in renewable energy. Mm -hmm. So they've stepped in and at the same time they're now looking at technology that they've used in the past that could be used uh, more efficiently or for biomass. A lot of work on biomass, meaning as an example, when we sort our lawn waste, we put it out on Fridays or right. whatever day per week and we send this out, it goes to a landfill. Right. In the future, we won't be sending this to the landfill. It will be go to some kind of biomass renewable energy that all of that landfill will have been converted to biomass into some kind of energy for us. It kind of makes a little sense. I know that even when you have your own little compost pile at home, it starts mm -hmm. to, you know, you get some... Uh, you get some good methane <laughs> or that's other right. gases that are going there, and that's you, you can use that. Can't that's you? right. Matter of fact, I saw something on the internet today. I was reading some an article about uh, the Winter Olympics because they were um, uh, you know, there, there's this thing about whether or not there's going to be enough snow up there in in the Cascades mm -hmm. for the, and apparently that's not an issue up there in Whistler. But they were saying that it some of the venues uh, that they are actually. Uh, heating like the facilities. I think it may have been some of the dormitories using the uh, the, the waste material and the. I guess it's a biomass kind mm -hmm. of a process to uh, draw heat to heat the facilities. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to it sounds to me, and from some of the things you and I have talked about, that there is a movement in the direction of figuring out how we can um, provide uh, sources of energy without having to totally rely on oil and gas and, and whatever. And I think you mentioned a key thing, I hadn't, hadn't thought about this before, but you talked about things that require liquid fuel. And we have a lot of that, airplanes, cars, tractors, you know, the- Railroads and the automobiles. Railroads, yeah, you know, and, and that's a huge thing. Um, so what about, how, how, are, how have the Europeans handled this sort of thing? Because they seem to be a little further ahead of the curve than we are when it comes to finding ways to uh, um, reduce the utilization of, of the, the fossil fuel. Well, they have a different incentive, perhaps one that we'll be following in the future, but of course, in general, they're more uh, environmentally friendly and willing to pay for it. Second thing is uh, their cities are more compact. It's easier for them to use uh, mass transport. It's a lot easier for them than it is for us. Uh, they've pushed it by having uh, higher taxes on the gasoline and the diesel. Oh, so okay. that's definitely promoted. But at the same time, they're more reliant on imported energy. For example, uh, if you remember a couple of years ago when there was a dispute between the Ukraine and Russia oh, regarding right, natural yeah. gas. Right. And Moscow turned off the gas in the January, yes, in right. the middle of winter. And that. they shut off the gas to Ukraine and at the same time shut off the gas to half of uh, Europe including Germany, and all those factories idled. So over there, they have a different idea about energy independence. We still have 50% of the oil, liquid, uh, petroleum that we need. That's a lot more they have in Europe. So they're much more conservation-minded. Uh, and they're, they do get more efficiency uh, in their national productivity per mm -hmm. unit of energy, probably about 10% more than ours. And that's a place where we have a chance to actually wring a lot more profit out of our energy. The, the easiest thing to do is to be more efficient with what you have. Right. And all of our buildings in general leak energy. Oh, you sure. know, we never insulated enough when, when who, energy was cheap. Who worried about it? Right. No problem. But yeah. now those are the quickest things to do uh, in terms of saving energy costs. And that's happening in commercial companies everywhere. Steve, one of the things that, that 
you and I had talked about was that it, um, the sustainability of moving down, continuing to move on the path that we've moved on. And we were talking about some of the, the major challenges associated if you continue to use the primary sources of fuel that we've been using for the last however many hundreds of years, uh, th that has some challenges. And, and, and you have some charts here talking about growth and stuff like that that mm -hmm. it was very revealing to me because I hadn't considered this, uh, the fact that, that you're, we're, we're going to run into a problem of there's only so much that we can pull out uh, fast enough to, to meet the, de uh, the energy demands of uh, a world that's uh, aggressively moving in a power-hungry uh, direction. That's right. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Well, you know, during, let's say, the last 20 years, and this is a, a kind of a wide framing statement, we used, our growth was, you know, maybe 2% per year. Same with Europe. So our growth is pretty predictable in terms of our energy needs. But outside of this area, in the developing world, things have been changing because after all these years of support and activity in those countries, there's a lot of countries that are growing more than 5%. Now, right now it's a little slowed down. Just before this recession, there was over 100 countries growing over, over 5% per year. In those areas, when someone goes from, let's say, four or $500 a year to 1,000 or 2,000 a year, we don't think that's that much, but for them it's a tremendous change in their lifestyle. Sure. Everybody wants to use an appliance, or they need to get um, a washing machine that they never had, mm -hmm. or just some more lights. Well, if you take 100 million people and give each one a 100 uh, watt light bulb, that's a lot of power and a lot of power stations, and that's actually what's happening. So there's uh, demand, for example, about 200 million people moving into the middle class. 200 million people. From China and India. Oh, of course, And yeah. there'll be even more. So it's equivalent to the entire, uh, say, population of adults of the U.S. buying more appliances. Wow. So suddenly we have a lot more competition in the world. Right now, China is the second uh, biggest auto uh, buyer per year. Oh, sure. If not the first in the last few months. So... Everybody that has uh, the opportunity for a car, all the young guys, the same as our young guys. Yeah, yeah. I need a car. I got a paycheck. <laughs> get me a car. Get me a car. I can go. Well, you know, it's it's good for, uh, yeah, for dates and things. But but that's a real interesting point because one of the things that that uh, has been an important um, thrust worldwide in the last fifteen or twenty years has been to try to find ways to uh, provide economic opportunity and advancement in third world countries. I mean, the, the concept is that uh, if you can provide a level of economic opportunity for people, then they're less likely to, mm -hmm. um, you know, overthrow governments and go into, you know, terrorist activities and various other things like that. And there's statistics that can prove that. And mm -hmm. there's the, the microcredit world and all this sort of things that are going mm -hmm. on to help uh, people in the third world uh, move in that direction of becoming in the middle class. But the unintended consequence of that is that the energy demands are going through the roof, okay? Mm -hmm. So now what happens on the supply side? Well, on the supply side, uh, just before this recession, we were up to about 82 million barrels of oil consumed per day. 82 Can you imagine? million 82 barrels. million barrels, about a quarter of that coming to the U.S. Okay. So that's pretty close to what we can deliver per day. Up until around 2004, when a country needed more energy, there was enough capacity. Someone could turn it on in a few weeks or months and it would be there. Mm -hmm. But around 2004, we crossed over. Demand began to be sustained. Remember, China was really ramping up and mm -hmm. still ramping mm -hmm. up. So they're buying all the energy they can get. They're buying enormous amounts of coal. They just signed an 80, let's say, $60 billion agreement with Australia. I saw that, yeah. So they're securing uh, energy supplies mm -hmm. and raw materials to, to feed this drive that they have. So this is happening uh, everywhere and the oil supply will not be able to uh, increase very much more than where we are. So the demand goes up, the price will go back up. Okay, so let's talk about the renewable side and where and how the renewable energy possibilities can help mitigate this challenge. I don't see us being able to eliminate fossil fuel uh, as, as a source of energy. I mean, you said a little bit earlier, it's incredibly efficient. We have to find better ways to use it, cleaner ways to use it, ways to offset some of the CO2 uh, right. components. But, but where, 
how much can the renewable energies actually uh, increase the capacity to deliver energy? Well, first of all, with renewables, it's a small percentage of the whole vast amount of energy we need. So first, we need to be a lot more efficient with the power that we have. The U.S. uses about twice as much power per person as even Europe. So we have a lot of waste that we can actually tune out of our system and that will save us all a lot Where of money. Where does that come from? Does that come from just the, the way our buildings are architected? The, it's the, the buildings, the fact that we drive a lot more because we're farther spread apart. We have bigger cars, heavier cars that, re, that burn more fuel. Uh, all these in general make a difference. That, but it does give an opportunity to streamline our demands maintaining the same lifestyle. Okay. So that's a good thing. Right. Secondarily, on the renewables, First of all, it was a big threat to the country when you see energy going over $100. It's just so much money going out of the country. Everybody's worried about this. Right. So DARPA, which is our defense industry that supports R&D, has put a lot of effort in this. How can we be uh, more independent? A lot of work's being done here where this next second and third generation we'll be seeing in the next few years. For example, uh, how to turn the green stuff in the ocean, the algae, mm -hmm into biomass and turn the biomass into fuel. Mm. There's numerous companies right here in the valley working on this and there's progress being made. This will be converted into uh, various fuels that can be used, for example, some places electricity, some places it's liquid fuels, but you have some choices here. And uh, there's uh, power companies, uh, oil companies involved in this, even in the algae and turning this into jet fuel. Now, so far, you saw in the news in the last 18 months, right. four different airliners have flown on biomass fuel, turned into jet fuel, uh -huh. exactly meeting the spec. I hadn't noticed that. So oh. Virgin Air, New Zealand Air have, have flown, Continental has flown on renewable energy. Now, what was that... Uh, the Full tanks, or was that a percentage of what? That was, was a small, that was very small. Those were those were tests up in the air. No, but I mean, was it was it a percentage of the fuel that was in the fuel tanks of the aircraft, or was it 100 percent the bio? It was 50-50 blend. 50-50 blend, um, which is pretty significant. Biomass to well, there'll never be enough jet fuel to replace what we're using, so 50-50 right. blend is fantastic. Yeah, really. But it's already passed all those very rigid tests. That's that's a big deal. And so, at the next step, will be to scale this up and. Uh, do you uh, commercialize it? The, the kind of fuel that can be generated from the renewables, from the biomass, does it have uh, a different level of CO2 emission associated with it, or is it still pretty much the same? We've got to find other ways okay. of mitigating the CO2 situation. Here, here's the deal with the CO2. That's a good question because we never used to talk about the life cycle of anything like this. We just, how much fuel do you need? Put it in the tank, fill it up. In the future, we'll probably say something like, you know, maybe 10 years from now, we might say to the family, all right, do you want to go to the mountains for summer vacation on a 1,500-mile drive and uh, have 2,000 pounds of CO2, or do you want to go to the beach 10 times? Which one do you want to do? Because we have to manage our CO2 budget. Hmm. That's probably coming. Hmm. Not tomorrow, so don't worry about it, <laughs> but down the road. But in terms of CO2, when we look at... Um, CO2 in the atmosphere, when we burn carbon, in, when it's in the coal, carbon, we mm -hmm. burn it, we're making CO2. Right. True. That's the part that's adding, uh, heating up the atmosphere. Right. And that's affecting weather. That looks like it'll have a lot of effects in the future for us as we keep piling this on. Right. So if we were to take CO2 and uh, recycle it through trees, Mm -hmm. And then the tree is used, made into, let's say, furniture. We have biomass, mm -hmm. and the crops are recycled. Well, now it looks like we're just recycling the CO2 in the atmosphere from a plant right. then to energy use and back to the plant. So right. the goal is to keep it in that cycle as opposed to going into uh, petroleum, which is old CO2 and adding to the uh, total. See, we don't want to increase uh, the total uh, 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 more. Okay, right okay. now we're at uh, about So if you're using the renewables, the, the kind that you're talking about, the biomass, the, the algae or whatever, then what you're doing is, yes, you are um, in, in the process of utilizing that source for power. You're going to release some CO2, but by virtue of the fact that you are using these uh, plant mm -hmm. um, components to create more energy there, it's going to be drawing out because the plant has to grow and it lives on CO2. It draws the CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's right. Uh, okay, I didn't quite, I didn't quite understand the, uh, the, the cycle on that, but that makes a lot of sense. Very cool. So, um, 
Let's talk a little bit more about some of these ramifications for not taking action into the renewable energy arena. What are the, because I, we've talked about this a little bit before the show too, and I, I was thinking that th there's a number of different things. There's economic impact, there's social impact, there's impact to industry, the ecological impact, and certainly the political impact too. Mm -hmm. I mean, you look at these com countries from whom um, Western Europe and the United mm -hmm. States are buying all this uh, oil, and if suddenly they don't need to do that, what's the political implications of all of that sort of thing? How is that? So f from what you've studied and, and your work in the renewable world, what are some of the impacts here, and what do we need to, to understand? What do we need to do? Well, generally, renewables are not going to save the day and solve all problems. It's another form of energy and hopefully cleaner if we do it right, but it, doing it right is important because if you clear a forest to plant palm oil and get all this oil to make biodiesel or some other biomass energy, but you burn the forest to plant the palm, what's the trade-off? It's not good, it's actually worse. You've added all this CO2. So uh, in fact, in Europe, they pushed back and said, we don't want any more palm oil from that kind of source. So that's where the life cycle comes in. So we have to manage the life cycle and actually be certain that we're actually having uh, valid trade-offs. Mm -hmm. Overall, we can make a con contribution to the total energy we need, and this is a good way to do it, and to help other countries have additional amounts of energy, but it needs to be uh, managed in this way. But here's a big problem. There's a big controversy, as you hear, about the CO2 and climate warming. Right. Now, whether you agree or not, of the source of it, some people say it's not human cost and others are sure it is. There's no question that CO2, when it rises in the atmosphere, changes the weather patterns. Sure. And it makes the atmosphere warmer. So the question on this, if we try to reduce this, is important, but it costs money. And right now, obviously, business people don't want any more expenses. Right. So there's really a trade-off coming on this. In Europe, they're willing to trade a little bit more. In the U.S., we do support certain things by tax incentives mm -hmm. in the ethanol. The biodiesel just lost an incentive that it had, a dollar a gallon. Mm. That's slowed everything down there. But this cost uh, for CO2 mitigation, it's now showing up in equipment that costs more because it has scrubbers attached, for example, the well, power plants. Sure, well, and, and in the, um, the trucking industry here mm -hmm. in California, I mm -hmm. mean, they're having to put these... Um, um, uh, units onto the existing fleet of the mm -hmm. diesel trucks to, uh, to reduce particulate matter and exhaust mm -hmm. emissions, and it costs the trucker something like twenty thousand dollars per vehicle. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the cost of doing some of these things can can be uh, significant, but the the effect f for not doing it it could be catastrophic. Well, you know, we're also getting used to having cleaner air here. Right. But if you remember Los Angeles 15 and 20 years ago. Oh, yeah, I had lived but, down in L.A. And at one point, it was terrible. But now, I travel a lot, and I've been to countries where there's big, big, big cities and lots of cars. Take Bangalore in India, for example. Every day, there's 3,000 more cars there, and that city's already completely crowded. Just going about five miles can be an hour. Ouch. And yet, you know, the cars are coming. The smog controls are nowhere near like they are here, right. so there's a lot of smoke in the air in many, many cities around the world. We're way ahead on that, as is Europe. My wife was in Beijing uh, before the, uh, the Beijing Olympics, and uh, she said that it, it was um, some period of weeks or a month and a half beforehand, right. and she said that air quality was mm -hmm. an issue. And they cleaned it up a lot because they stopped uh, mm -hmm. factories from producing right. during that point in time, but now I, I understand it's back again. We only have a few minutes left in the show. I want to talk about something that you mentioned just a few minutes ago that I think is uh, useful and significant, and that is that uh, we have to find, uh, th there are multiple solutions to this, to this problem, okay? There is not one alternative or um, uh, renewable source that is the solution. Uh, I, I've looked at, I've seen stuff before, everybody touched their thing, wind, solar, you know, geothermal, whatever, but I, I think the point here is that depending on where you are on the planet, one or another of these, uh, or, or a combination of these renewable sources might be appropriate for where you happen to be, the country that you're living in. I mean, is that a fair statement? That's a fair statement. Uh, we can use wind and solar and biomass. Now municipal waste is going into these giant 
digesters look like a compost heap. Yeah. And out is coming methane, which is turning a generator. Right. And there's electricity. Used to be waste, and now there's electricity coming from that source. There's a new uh, residential uh, and hotel complex in Las Vegas, yet another. They just opened up, and it's called the city center. Oh, yeah, They're yeah, yeah. generating their own power there. They have natural gas coming in, turning uh, turbines to make electricity. Mm -hmm. And what used to be waste exhaust is now running the equipment and heating everyone's uh, water for their units. Oh, wow. So their total energy costs a little bit less. It's more efficient. And uh, that's, a, 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 I think, a notion of what's coming. Very cool. So there's, there are... <laughs> You know, when we talked about doing this show, one of the things that uh, I was thinking about was there is clearly uh, a challenge, okay? And I was not at all clear as to whether or not there was a, um, any kind of intelligent solution that was available. Because I haven't kept up on literature like you have. I mean, the studying mm -hmm. that you've done has been significant. But it sounds to me like there actually are some some positive uh, direction, motion in the direction of finding and utilizing these things. It, it, do we have the political and economic will to make it happen, I guess, is the key statement. Do you have anything? I, I think the answer is yes. You know, one thing that's fantastic about our country is our inventiveness. I, I've seen it. The technology's already happened now. We've made jet fuel from green grass. Right. And that's happened. It's getting scaled up. So I would say in 10 to 20 years, there'll be a revolution about how our energy is being produced in this country. To the good for us, there'll be a lot less of importing and more of using our own. So it's a very good thing. And that's one of the things we do well. Fantastic. So, And with that, Steve, we have to sign off for the day. I really appreciate your coming. This has been a fantastic discussion. And I hope that folks out there have uh, taken uh, some of this information to heart because we really do need to uh, be proactive in, in this arena. So ladies and gentlemen, we appreciate your joining us here on Reference Point. If you have any thoughts or questions, either for Steve or myself, or in something that you want to see here on the show, send us an email at info at referencepointtv.com, and we'll be more than happy to get your questions answered or to uh, look at uh, doing a show on, on a particular subject of your interest. So thank you very much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Reference Point. Good.